good to be in God's house. Amen. Amen. Before we finish completely here and get into the offering time, I asked Pastor Tim to kind of share experience that he told me with uh, Kids XP. Go ahead. So uh, the end of February, February 28th and 29th, we had an event called Kids XP, mm -hmm. and we had 23 kids that signed up to be there overnight here at the church, and two kids that decided to come for the, just the Friday night portion here at the church. And we started out the evening with just some dinner and uh, some fellowship, but then we came in here um, into the, to the sanctuary and did a couple of lessons and teaching. And the, the first teaching we did was talking about our words and talking uh, positively towards people and uh, blessing people with our words and not, you know, bringing them down and how to shine Christ's light in that. And Jesse Major did an awesome job teaching that to the kids. And then I followed up with a whole entire sermon series piece about how the Holy Spirit, you know, helps us shine Christ's light. He needs to become more. Oh, we know. need to become less. Mm -hmm. And after me speaking to the kids for a little while, I just put some worship music on and just had the kids find a spot in the sanctuary to pray. And um, we started praying over the kids as they were praying. And there were several kids just seeking God with all they had. They were on their faces just praising and, and, and seeking after God. And then the next day, just seeing those kids just learning and just raising their hands and worship at the, the event up in Princeton, and they were just pouring their hearts out. And I had a couple of kids come up to me and they said, Pastor Tim, I want more. You know, I want more, not just of, of this, but I want more of, let, 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 let's do better for BGMC. Let's do better for this. You know, we were the number eighth in the state for bringing in BGMC offering last year, but they want to do more this year. They want to reach people for the lost. They want to, to read their Bibles more. They want to worship God more. And so it was just encouraging to see that. You know, some of the kids even asked me, you know, today is National BGMC Day. And so they asked if we could put the, the barrels out or the, the offering containers out in the, the fellowship or the foyers here. And so some kids will be out there after service just as an encouraging face. And if you guys want to put some change in there, you guys can. But they want to do more. They want more of God. So it was just encouraging to see that. So isn't that something? There you go. I should be on now. <laughs> isn't that something? You know, when our kids want more of God, then there is there is a power that's just waiting to explode. Amen. Our kids, they're, they're sold out for God. They, they want to be active. They, they have a vision that's bigger than yesterday. And I like that. We need that, amen? amen? And if that is in our children, that they want to be in the presence of God, and that their vision for tomorrow is bigger than what yesterday had for them, then I think we're out for a ride. And the Lord knows. The Lord knows what's, what's in the heart of our kids. He knows the plans that He has for us. And we get to enjoy that as, as we are being part of God's kingdom and he can move through us. And I, I want to see that stirring of the Holy Spirit in our kids. And he's doing that already. Isn't that great? Give the kids a big hand once more. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. You guys ready for the word? Like I announced, I felt like uh, to spend three weeks... Uh, according to a, a picture that the Lord gave me, um, just to, to talk about the Holy Spirit. Are you excited about it? Or are you scared? You're not scared about it, right? Come on, we're a Pentecostal church. And we like it that way. <clears throat> One of our things that we want to do is give freedom to the Holy Spirit. Uh, what you saw here today, this morning too, just in worship, we just like to come into the presence of God. And it's the Holy Spirit moving, right? He stirs our heart. We live by the Spirit. Amen? Are you walking in the Holy Spirit? Are you living in the Holy Spirit? We can feel Him during the day, right? Right? Yeah, we can feel the Holy Spirit during the day. Do you talk to the Holy Spirit sometimes? Ask Him for forgiveness or ask Him to guide you or ask Him to sometimes speak a little bit louder? Because you doubt if you kind of hurt, right? <clears throat> but that's, that's the Holy Spirit, right? We live in the Holy Spirit. We breathe in the Holy Spirit. Uh, we got to grow in the Holy Spirit, you know? I have a sermon series, actually. I, uh, first, I felt like the Lord gave me a sermon series, but I, I wanted to push that off a little bit longer. It's, uh, I, I, the next one is going to be called New Life in the Word. 
and I'm excited about that one too. But I, um, just this last couple, uh, what was it, maybe one month, maybe one and a half months, <clears throat> I had a, a couple different conversations with people about uh, what it means to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, uh, what the Holy Spirit is, just doctrinal differences. Uh, if you have your Bible, there's something interesting I want to show you. Open your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Where is it? 23, I believe. Okay, here is one verse for you. This is, this is a, a theological nugget for you, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in the verse 13. This is what the Apostle Paul writes to the church. He says, For in one spirit you were all baptized into one body. Jews and Greeks, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Now, believe it or not, but over this one passage, we had two denominations emerge. There was uh, a split among uh, theological differences, and emerged uh, came the Baptist denomination and the Pentecostal denomination. And they split over this verse and what it means to be baptized into one body. <clears throat> Can you believe it? It sometimes happens. You know, what does it mean? So if in the Baptist, uh, believe, what is your background? If you were like born and raised uh, Pentecostal, would you raise your hand? Just, just for sake of comparison, okay, we have Pentecostals here, born and raised Pentecostals. If your uh, background is Baptist, would you raise your hand? There you go, we got Baptist background, Lutheran background, tons of Lutheran background, okay, Catholic background, also Catholic background. So we have different backgrounds, right? And we, as a Pentecostal church, we talk about the Holy Spirit. We give freedom to the Holy Spirit. We probably talk more about the Holy Spirit than any other denomination, right? But does this make us weird? sometimes it does, right? Okay, let's admit it, sometimes it does. But I, I honestly, I don't think we can ever talk too much about the Holy Spirit. And I, I, I felt like, you know, with this series, the Lord has given me a very simple picture to explain sometimes what we have made very complicated. Uh, and I call this sermon series, Crank Up the Volume. I to told about it already crank up the volume, because when we talk about the Holy Spirit, and to have more of the Holy Spirit, or to have less of the Holy Spirit, everybody who is not being baptized in the Holy Spirit yet is not a lesser Christian, amen? He's not. There is no second-class Christianity. Sometimes we are getting accused as Pentecostals that we have created a second-class Christianity, that we think that we are better than other Christians just because we have experienced the gift of God in the baptism of the Holy Spirit or speaking in tongues as his initial physical evidence of the subsequent experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Like, man, we made this complicated, right? We, we have this nice language around it, and this language was created in order to safeguard the experience. Because we, we want this experience. We want more of the Holy Spirit. But, you know, when it comes down, it's really simple. And God has designed it really simple. It's the same Spirit, right? It's not like with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden you have a different Spirit, right? It's the same Spirit. And so the Lord gave me this picture. It's as easy as cranking up the volume at a loudspeaker somewhere. Do you have, loud, do you have something in a home, home that has a volume button? You know, it can be very quiet. What happens when it's very quiet? When it's very quiet, you kind of just hear almost like a background noise, isn't it? And you can still understand what you're saying. You can have your own will and your own wish. And you, you just go about, do, do what you want to do. And just there's this faint background music somewhere in the background. And I'm just imagine that's like with the Holy Spirit the same way. There is like this lower level of the Holy Spirit where the Holy Spirit speaks. And I, I call this level the conscience level. Because when we, when we are born again, we have the conscience level. That's the first level. It's like when the volume is all the way down. But you, you still get to live your own life, right? Uh, you, you always get to live your own life. But it feels like when the Holy Spirit only speaks on a conscience level, His voice is almost a little bit small. You can easily ignore it. You can easily quench it or grieve it. And you can uh, ignore it. You can walk over it. And you just, you just jitter-chatter. You just walk. Uh, you, you just live your life. It's like the volume on a speaker that's just really low. But then, when you start seeking God more, and one of the pictures that I really wanted to take away from this series is, who is in control of the volume button? 
Who is in control of the volume button, you think? Yes, that's right. That's us. It's not God. God doesn't do it for us. God gives what we ask of Him, right? We talked about last week or two weeks ago, it's ask, seek, knock, right? There is something about asking, seeking, knocking. It's like if we don't ask, we don't receive, right? We are in control of the volume button, and we get to decide if the voice of the Holy Spirit is all the way down, just like a background noise, and we can easily overhear that. Or if we seek more of God, we want more of God, we pray and we fast about Him, uh, and we, we, we just want more of His presence, and we actively seek it, and we uh, cancel out all the other background noise, like the noise of the TV, uh, the noise of, of that. I had a home visit this last week with somebody, and we had a wonderful time. He was just struggling personally because of pain and stuff, and so we, we had a, a very good time of, of prayer, and before I left, the TV was on the whole time, and kind of toward the end, I, I felt like saying something. I felt like, you know, when you get now, right now, back into the Word of God, I wanted to tell you something. The TV on your wall will always compete with the presence of the Word of God in your life. At some point, you got to switch it off. you got to tone it down. Cancel out the volume button. Uh, cancel out the background noise. We call this like white noise, right? This white noise that's constantly in the background. Everyone is speaking. Everybody wants to have a say. If you switch on the news, everything is hyper. There's always a very high voice. And it's like, at some point, you just got to crank it down. The volume of the, the, the noise of the world, you got to crank it all the way down. All of a sudden, you can hear the Holy Spirit more. And if you w seek more of the Holy Spirit, you want more of Him, you can actually crank the volume up and the Holy Spirit starts uh, speaking louder to us. But how do we do that? How do we crank up the volume of the Holy Spirit? We do this by praying and fasting, by seeking Him, by taking time with Him. First of all, uh, reducing the volume of the noise of the world around us. And so today what I want to talk about is the first level, and that's exactly this conscience level. Just as a glimpse, there is, when you, once you crank up the volume, again, it's not a different spirit, it's not a, a different uh, thing that you get, it's the same Holy Spirit, but the more you seek of Him, the more you get, right? When you crank up the volume, the second level, I'm going to call next week the filling level. It fills you. All of a sudden, it's not just a, a still small voice. It's not just a tiny voice, but it's like, man, you, you are, like I, I had demonstrated once, this remote control car, and it's like the Holy Spirit is all over you. He's like, he's gearing you. You can feel him, and he's just filling your presence, and uh, he's there. He, he's, he, his, his voice is much louder. Just imagine a, a loudspeaker that you turn louder. You turn it louder, and kind of makes you want to dance, right? I don't know, maybe some of you <laughs> start dancing. I'm not, I maybe start singing with it, but it kind of animates us if we, we want to get along. When the volume is a little bit louder, it's the same with the Holy Spirit. Once, we, once he, we seek more of Him, He fills more inside of us, and we're like, we're there. We're there with what the Holy Spirit wants to do. We're there. If we go to jail and we go to ministry, we're th He's there. We're there with whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do. It's this filling level. And then there's a third level. And for the lack of terms, I call it the oozing out level. <laughs> it's uh, when it's not just filling us, but it's literally when it's just oozing out. Like we can't contain it. It's like wherever we go, people around us, we just open up our mouth. And even when, when we're just in the room, there's something that the Holy Spirit is touching in other people's lives. I mean, uh, other people just being convicted just if, if we're coming into the room. It's like, how weird is that, right? But it's like this oozing out level when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And He's not just this small voice, but it's like He's filling us. And we walk in this and we have our being in this. And this is where we live. And it's, it transpires out of us. Somehow we, we're becoming the aroma of Christ. It's, it has this sweet smell wherever we go. It's this oozing out level. Hallelujah. I believe God wants that of us. And that's what I call Pentecostal. We want more of the Holy Spirit. We want more of the Spirit of God in our life. We don't just want Him on a small conscience level, but we want that volume to be cranked up. Because we cannot live this life in our own strength, right? We mess up way too many times, right? We want more of the Holy Spirit. We want Him to be in control, to be in charge. We just want to be that remote control car. And he says, left, I go left. I have no idea why we go left, but I trust God that God knows what he is doing. Even though sometimes our brain gets in a way and we do not understand it, 
but let's reduce it down now to the conscience level. This is really the first one. And in order to understand the Holy Spirit on this, this conscience, because there's something really important in this conscience level that I just want to highlight. And I want to tell you that most Christians today, I believe, live on a conscience level. Okay? And there's a reason why. Here, let's get into it. First of all, what I want to shoot ahead is that we were created as spiritual beings. You know, sometimes you think when we talk about the Holy Spirit, it's just this extra thing that comes, you know, with the presence of God. But if you look in Genesis uh, chapter 2, let, let's flip through. I'm, I'm going to flip around here a little bit, okay? Is that okay? Okay, if you read the Bible. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it says, and this is the creation account. When God created, he said, and then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils, the, in the Hebrew it says the ruah, it the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. Something became alive. Some, did you ever see a, a, a potter who is making, uh, when we visited um, this Austrian guy that, that, that we met, um, yes, there's more Austrians in, in, the, in, in the area. And so we visited him. And it's really cool. One of the things that he wants to start is pottery right now. So he got like his little wheel and everything. And he explained what he wants to get started. And the, all the little pots that he were making already, they didn't look like very beautiful. But one day he wants to get there and start selling them, you know. But if you have ever watched somebody who does pottery, did you ever observe that one stage when this lump of clay that may be a beautiful vase or something, it grew legs and started to walk? I haven't. <laughs> it's like, I, I haven't, right? A, a dead clay is a dead clay. It's just, it's just dead, right? But God created, just like on this potter's wheel, he just created this beautiful vessel, uh, a lump of clay that looked like uh, us, right? Like, like a man with arms, limbs, and everything. And then, but it was still lifeless, right? Uh, flesh can only ever kill. Flesh is, 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 is prone to destruction. It's like, to, re to dust we shall return. It's like, we are clay, and one day we're going to return to dust. Uh, but it's the breath of God. It's the substance of God. It's the spirit of God that God gave, and it gave life to lifeless clay, to lifeless beings. So we are, when, and it's this beautiful picture, we are created in the image of God, alive because of the Spirit of God. So we have a spirit, the Spirit of God already inside of us, and now when you take this in, in, in the back of your mind, flip all the way other, to the other side of, of the Bible, to James chapter 4. In James chapter 4, <clears throat> now listen to, what James says to the church here, um, in verse 4, James chapter 4, verse 4, first he calls them, you're adulterous people, but then he says, do you not know that the friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you, or do you suppose that it is to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. A very important scripture. So not only are we created by the spirit of God, we have the spirit of God inside of us. God yearns jealously. I love it that he puts jealously in there. It's like he wants to have the fellowship of the Holy Spirit inside of us again. He doesn't just want us to walk around and do our own stuff and reject God and not wanting to have anything to do with Him. God yearns for the fellowship of the Spirit that has come out from Him. He wants that fellowship. He wants that unity. He wants uh, uh, everything that I explained about the tabernacle back then. It's like in this inner court, the closer to you get to God, the more we feel like our spirit is with God and God's spirit is with us and we are one you know we, we we are in god and god is in us in christ we are reconciled to god all this language means that god has made his spirit to dwell in us and he yearns for the spirit now we can ignore that we can walk away we can 
occurs God. We can live our own life. We can just not wanting every, anything to do with God. Sometimes in, a lot of people are angry at God at some point in life because something happens, and they're just like, I don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. And all this. So they just walk in their own way, uh, do what, what is pleasing to them, and they just walk away. But all along, God is not rejecting them. God is not like, okay, you're, you're going to hell. Huh? Pity or shame on you. No, he's not. He's, he's running after them, right? He's loving them because he yearns for the spirit that he has made to dwell in that person. If this guy is in jail, if this guy has killed somebody, if this guy has messed up all his life, no matter what this guy has gone through or woman has gone through, God yearns for the spirit to have fellowship with him again. And he wants that. We have this picture in... Uh, okay, let, let, let's uh, one more scripture. In Ephesians chapter 2, we see another very important thing when we talk about the Spirit of God inside of us, and that is that it can be dead inside of us, okay? And that's in Ephesians chapter 2, um, where Apostle Paul writes to the church in, in Ephesus, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. So in our sins, in doing our own stuff, uh, not wanting to listen to God, we were dead. It's, we were lifeless again, right? So it talks about the spiritual state of the spirit inside of us that's literally as good as dead. And if, if, did you ever touch a dead body? It's not moving, right? You kind of poke it, and it's not moving. It's, it's dead. Dead is dead. It's like it's, it, 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 it's there, but it's not moving. It's not speaking, it's not giving off warmth anymore. It's not correcting you. It's not encouraging you anymore. It's not saving you. It's not doing anything. It's somehow just dead inside of us. And he kind of goes on here. Uh, dead in the trespasses and sin in which you once walked, following the, the course of this world, following the, uh, the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience and among whom... We all once lived, we all, we all come from the same mess, right? We all once lived there with the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. So we're all coming from the same mess. We're all sinners saved by grace. But then he talks about in verse 5, but, but the, um, he made us alive together with Christ. So he gave us life again. We were once dead but all of a sudden, we have the stage of life again. In Romans chapter 8, I, I keep talking about it, it's, this, 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 it's the chapter of the Spirit. We are alive in Christ. We are in Christ and in, 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 uh, in the Holy Spirit. We have, uh, you've you got to study the, 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 the letter of Romans. It actually makes a climax. He builds up. I was like, I failed. I have all my shortcomings. I want to, but I cannot. I find myself in this pickle. I want to do the right thing, but I, I cannot carry it out. And so he, he talks about this, but then he comes to the Spirit, and the Spirit give, gives life. See, this is the state that God wants us to live. He wants us to live in the presence of the Spirit and to be navigated by the Spirit. But how do you move from lifeless from the Spirit of God inside of us being dead to having this Romans chapter 8 life where we just live in the Holy Spirit and have life to the fullness and we're not anymore under the law but the, the law of the Spirit of life, just this language. We have all this, but how do you get from A, from being dead, to alive, having the Spirit of God alive? And now I want to turn to John chapter 16. I want to dwell there a little bit. In John chapter 16, this is what Jesus is teaching about the Holy Spirit when he sends the helper. And it gives us the key about the Holy Spirit just operating on the conscience level. Okay, so this is in uh, verse 7, John chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage uh, that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit is our helper. Amen? Amen. He's not a butcher. He's not mean to us. He wants to help us. He wants to navigate. He wants to advise us when we lack counsel. He is the helper. Um, he will not come. Otherwise, he will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when, when he comes, 
He will convict, everybody underline the word convict if you can, convict the world concerning three things. Now, he will convict the world. What, what does that mean? The trees or the fields or the deers in the forest? What does that mean? He, he, it means us, right? The, God sends, the Lord, will, he went away and he sends the helper to convict us, to convict us of three things. And very often, all we memorize is sins. The Holy Spirit will convict the world of its sins, period. But it actually says three things. And when you pay attention, those three things are actually in sequence. He convicts the world of sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me, wanting to do their own thing. I don't want to believe in God. I'm just living my own life. That's called sin, uh, wanting to do their own thing. But then concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. And then concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Amen. The ruler of this world is judged. Now, the world, the, the Holy Spirit is doing a work here. And he's convicting us of three things. He's, I just want to explain to you the word that he's using here. The word uh, convict is actually elexai. Um, it actually means to expose, to convict, and to cross-examine. To cross-examine for the purpose of convicting or refuting an opponent, especially used of legal proceedings. Hmm, it's interesting. The Lord Jesus uses a Greek word here, or the, the, the word that is used, he was speaking in Aramaic, but the, in the scripture we have the Greek word here, and the Greek word, the meaning of this is like a legal language, that the Holy Spirit is li literally our legal agent who is advocating for us against all the other stuff that's being thrown at us. That's good. You know, when I ever go to, to court, I want to have the Holy Spirit on my side. Amen? Because He is for us. He has good plans for us, and He is our, he, he's, he's speaking for us on our behalf, and He's convicting us. He's like this, this prosecutor. He's, he, he, he advocate. He stands with us in the trial, in the trial of life. The Holy Spirit stands with us. He doesn't depart from us. He stands with us if we allow Him to, and He does three things. He convinces, He convicts us, not our neighbor, him too, right? But first and foremost, he convicts us of sin, which basically means not to do our own stuff, but to believe in God. And we're not going into moralism and saying only alcohol is sin or only doing this is sin. Sin is, by definition, rebellion against God. And that happens in every area. If you don't glorify God for who he is, if you just want to do your own thing, it's literally saying, I am Lord over my own life and not you. That is sin. And then I just started living out my flesh. I start doing this or that or that and this. And, but those are all consequences. The primary, the, the root cause, the root sin is actually our rebellion against God. But we just want to do our own stuff and not have anything to do with God. And the Holy Spirit is convicting us that we can't live like this. But then once we, we commit to, to the voice of the Holy Spirit who is constantly speaking to us and even non-christians hear that even if non-christians are uh, have want to have nothing to do with god but they can sense that something is not right they know exactly when they end up in jail uh, why they ended up in jail they're not happy about it but there's like th there is a conviction about something and it's, it's that spirit of god inside of us the spirit of a holy god of a righteous god who is telling us what is right and what is wrong and so he's convicting of, of our sins. And if we submit, if we say, Lord, take away our sins. I'm sorry I messed up. Come into my life. I want you to be the Lord of our life. All of a sudden, uh, this, this spirit inside of us becomes alive again. But then the work of the Holy Spirit continues in that he keeps convicting us. The second thing that he keeps convicting us with is righteousness. Righteousness. Because the Lord says concerning um, concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and, and you will see me no longer. It's like the Lord is going away, 
So who is telling us now what is right and what is wrong? See, the disciples always had Jesus Christ as he was walking among them to tell them this is right and this is wrong and this is how you ought to live. But Jesus sometimes like, oh, you of little faith, you're still not getting it. How long do you have to be? Like teaching them the ins and outs about life. Did your parents ever teach you this is right and this is wrong? Right? Did, did you, right? Sometimes we go by it and sometimes we disregard it, you know? But the Holy Spirit, after we have confessed our sins and we're coming back to God, He wants to continue the work inside of us by teaching us to discern between right and wrong. Right? We know the scripture. He wants us to discern between what is pleasing to God, what, what is good and pleasing to God. He wants to teach us in all those aspects to live a life that is pleasing to God so that we can be the pleasing aroma of Christ, that we can be his ambassadors, not speaking for ourselves, but for God himself, right? He wants us to walk in this righteousness. And then even when, when we have learned to walk in righteousness, to walk in accordance to what God wants us to do. We come to a third thing. The Holy Spirit, He's convicting us concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit teaches us, He convicts us of, of, of authority that we have over the evil one. Somebody shout Amen. Because that's good news. We have authority over all the stuff that Satan is throwing our way. All the accusing voices, what he's saying to us uh, when, when we have weird stuff going on in our life, weird stuff going on in our heart, we just can't help ourselves. We, we can't do the things on our own and the enemy's just coming and he's, uh, he's making us fall all the time. We have victory over the enemy, but the thing is, we cannot assume this victory. We will not have victory over him if we're not righteous. The prayer of a righteous availed much. Amen. So we need to be in this discernment uh, between what is pleasing to God and what is not pleasing. Because if we're living a lifestyle that is not pleasing to God, we leave so many open doors for the enemy that we'll never have authority over him because he has like almost a legal right to our life, right? So it starts in this sequence. The Holy Spirit is coming in on a conscience level in the beginning when we uh, confess our sins, we come back to Jesus and we allow the Holy Spirit in our life and he starts his work. He, con he, he convicts us of sin. He convicts us to, to walk in the right way, to, to discern between what is right and good, uh, what, what, uh, what is bad, what is pleasing to God, and what is displeasing to God. You know, every once in a while I use this example, I like this example. People sometimes ask me if I have seen this in this movie. And I, if, if I know of the movie, I usually give the answer, you know, I, I think I would like the movie, but you know, every movie I watch, I watch with the Holy Spirit, and he's a very picky movie watcher. He's really picky. You know, what he wants to watch and what he doesn't want to watch. You know, and maybe other people, they, I know, sometimes what makes me wonder is like, I, I think you're not really listening to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Because if you would, I think the Holy Spirit inside of you would not like to watch what you're watching, what you allow, what you're soaking in with your eyes right there. It's not food for the Holy Spirit. True, Amen. It's not food for the Holy Spirit. It's abhorring Him sometimes, and it ma makes Him it makes Him grieve. Actually, we we're gonna get to this point in a second. So we live in the Spirit, and we w He convicts us of sin, of righteousness, and when we walk in those things, then we can have authority over the evil one in our life too. But all of this, when the volume on the loudspeaker. When the volume is just really soft only, if it's not this filling level where it's just, man, that volume is cranked up, and I can tap, I can dance, I can sing, I'm just moved by it, you know, I just want to go with that Holy Spirit. If it's not like this, if the voice of the Holy Spirit, if the volume is, what, what, what did the Holy Spirit say? You know, it's like, you've got to listen twice. It's so easy to miss it when the volume is all the way down. That's the point. It's so easy to miss what the Holy Spirit is saying when the volume is all the way down. Um, there's two things that we can do to the Holy Spirit that are not good. 
that is grieving the Holy Spirit and quenching the Holy Spirit. And the Bible is clear about that. Uh, let's look at the first one, grieving the Holy Spirit. This is in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And again, it's, um, where, it's where the Apostle Paul teaches about life. Uh, the, actually, the whole section here is called the new life, right? We live a new life. He says we ought to speak the truth. We, we are not supposed to lie. We're supposed to speak the truth. He says, uh, be angry and do not sin. You know, don't, don't let the uh, sun go down while you're still angry. Deal with your anger. It's like uh, to, to do, don't give opportunity to the devil. Uh, verse 29, it says, do not let corrupting talk come out of your mouth. What, just listen to this. What comes out of our mouth has the power to grieve the Holy Spirit inside of us. Do we realize that? It's like we cannot walk around criticizing and constantly putting everything down and everyone down and then expect the Holy Spirit to just help us and speak tenderly to us. It's not, wor it's not happening, right? We've got to speak life. And if we catch ourselves speaking bad or evil or criticizing, Lord, forgive me, Holy Spirit, cleanse my mouth. Touch my lips. T take this, this glowing coal from the altar and just touch my lips again, just like you did with Jeremiah. Just touch my lips. Just sanctify me, right? But then he goes on and says, uh, in verse 30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, the word grief here means to cause sorrow or grief. To cause sorrow or grief. You know, did you ever grieve your parents? Cause sorrow to your parents? Right? <laughs> we all did, right? We all have been there. I mean, we were children, right? We all, at some form or the other, have caused grief to our parents. Now, how did that look like? They wanted something for us, and we just didn't want to do that, right? We disobeyed. How, what are forms or ways that we, can, that we have grieved our parents that made them grieve over us? Just throw out a couple examples. Disobedience. What? Lie. What? Rebellion. Rebellion, yes. Yes, wanting to be independent. This is my life. I want to do what I want to do. There's a lot of stuff out there by which we can cause grief to the parents, right? Now, it's the same grief that we can cause the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit has a good intention for our life, He wants to tell us, He wants to teach us, He wants to convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He wants to do that work in us, but if the volume is just really down, um, it's kind of easy to overhear that voice too, right? And so we start disobeying, we start wanting to do our own life, and like, I know you say that, but you know, it's, it was just a fleeting thought. I, I just, you know, the, the voice of the world just speaks so much louder. I just want to have that party too, right? right now, and I just go that way, and they're all celebrating. Why do I have to compromise? Christianity is so boring, right? I just want to have fun in my life. It's so easy to dismiss and to disregard the convicting uh, voice of the Holy Spirit if it's only on a small conscience level, and that's the dangerous part of it. But not only do we grieve the Holy Spirit with the things that we do, we can also quench Him, and it's a different kind of action, and we find this in First Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, verse 19. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. Again, um, Paul talks to the church in Thessalonica about different things. But at one, and he kind of tells the church of, of, of how to live and, and what to do, uh, final instructions and benedictions. The section is called Rejoice oh, Always, Pray Without Ceasing. He's like, he's giving them instructions about all the good stuff to do. Um, Pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, not just the good one, in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And then one of the other items is do not quench the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on, and do not despise prophecy. What, what is, wait, wait, wait a second, like, you, you mentioned that so fast. Do not quench the Spirit. You know, there is one thing that we can do is grieve the Holy Spirit. We, we cause him, like, we, we cause grief in the Holy Spirit. Uh, and the other thing that we can do is to quench it. Did you ever quench a fire? Right? 
Everybody has a fire extinguisher at home, right? Did you ever quench the fire? Like you had a fire going somewhere, and you felt like, oh, this fire is going too big, and you get out a bucket of water, and you just extinguish the fire, or... I have to say, when I graduated from Bible college, I was all on fire for God. I still am, just in case you don't notice it. <laughs> but when I came from Bible college, one of the, actually the chairman of the Pentecostal movement, and he was more the traditional way, the traditional kind, right? And uh, the, I, had a, I had the best grade in, in, in school that um, any, any student has ever had in that Bible college. And so everybody was really proud of me. The academic dean was really proud of me. Uh, and so he told then the, the chairman of the movement that came to Bible college to see all of us graduate. And I was like, man, you must be really proud of Arnold, isn't it? And he didn't know about it. I was like, well, yeah, let's see. Uh, he first has to come back to Austria. I was like, Austrians, man, they, they're really good. They're really quick with the fire extinguisher, I tell you. And, uh, and he said, yeah, he just kind of has to come back and kind of learn the ropes and get into that. He's going to be plugged in with the other horses on a car and kind of just pulling. And it's like, man, by that time, I'm dead. By that time, I've lost the fire already. There is something about extinguishing the fire of God. God wants to kindle that fire inside of us, and we can easily extinguish the fire if the Holy Spirit speaks, if the Holy Spirit wants to do something, if the Holy Spirit wants to give a prophecy. And I would say, for example, in the church, no, nope, we don't have that kind of stuff, that weird stuff. You know, I'm not like this. That's why I wrote on our website, one of our values is we give freedom to the Holy Spirit. Right? We want freedom of the Holy Spirit. We do not quench the Holy Spirit because there's a lot of stuff that only the Holy Spirit can point out. Only the Holy Spirit knows this stuff. When he, gosh, how many times am I praying for people and I just do not know what the person is going through and there is a supernatural revelation by the Holy Spirit about exactly the words, sometimes exact names that he's giving me or just stuff that I could not know in my heart but in obedience I step out and I say those things and it's the Spirit of God leading us. I could extinguish all of this. I could quench that, but I, I, I don't, right? Because we want the Holy Spirit. There's two things that we can do to the Spirit of God, and that is grieving Him when we hurt Him, when we cause Him sorrow, and when we cancel it out, when we just put a blanket on it or fire extinguisher, and shh, it's too hot, it's getting too hot. It's like, no, nah, I don't want to step out. Two things, and the problem is, when the Holy Spirit is only on a conscience level inside of us, it's too easy to grieve Him. It's too easy to ignore Him. And it's too easy to extinguish uh, and to quench what the Holy Spirit wants to do inside of us. And in order, and the Lord doesn't want us to live on a conscience level Holy Spirit only. The Lord wants us to live a life in fullness of the Holy Spirit. And he says, come, seek me. There was a reason why the Lord gave, gave me those words, just press in. It's like, crank up the volume of the Holy Spirit in the house. Just crank it up. It's like you're in charge of the volume button. Just crank it up. And the louder the Holy Spirit, uh, well, next week we're going to get to that. Like when, when it comes to the filling level, um, then you will notice when the Holy Spirit, when you're just in the role of the Holy Spirit, and he's just there, and you feel all comfy in that skin because it's the Holy Spirit inside your skin. And it, you it's harder to quench the Spirit at this point. Do you, do you realize that? It's harder to grieve the Holy Spirit because you're so much in, in tune with the Holy Spirit. You just want to do what's pleasing to Him. But if the Holy Spirit only rem remains on the conscience level, it's very fragile. It is very fragile. And I, that I believe, unfortunately, a lot of Christians nowadays only live with the Holy Spirit, with the fellowship of the Holy Spirit on a conscience level. Where this still small voice is speaking and it's just too easy to ignore it. It's too easy to not step out. And it's too easy to somehow miss it and somehow to quench it and then you wonder why nothing is happening in your life. But what the Lord wants is for us to crank up that volume, to have more of the Holy Spirit. Again, it's not a second class Christianity. It's not a different Holy Spirit that we're receiving. It's just more of the same Holy Spirit where He just wants to fill more of us. Amen? Amen. But more of that next week. Amen. But let's stand up. Let, let's close here. But I want to encourage you, if that is you, 
And if that, if, if you feel like you, you're struggling with the whole, you have not, never ever felt this filling level, this more of the Holy Spirit, uh, but you kind of still struggle with just listening and obeying the voice of the Holy Spirit on this conscience level, then don't, before you go home, just stay here a couple more moments. Let the altar team, let, let us pray for you. If the altar team, if you guys would uh, come forward, we just want to offer prayer again. If that's you, don't go home right away. Allow us to, to pray for you. Amen. Great. Hallelujah. The Lord wants to do that work inside of us. Amen. doesn't want us to remain poor, spiritually poor. He has made the spirit of himself to live inside of us. And he yearns for more of the Holy Spirit. But it's up to us to crank up that volume. So I urge you for until next week when we talk about this filling of the Holy Spirit, start seeking. Start seeking more of God. If you feel like that you have for too long dwelled at that volume, when you go home and you listen to the radio in your car, just think about this. Like how soft do you have this? And if you crank it up, that's what God wants us to do. He wants more of that spirit in our life. Start seeking more. Start asking more. We don't receive unless we ask. Seek, knock. Amen. Father, I thank you for the word. I thank you for how you have just been with us here this morning. I thank you for the scripture and for this image. It's so simple. We just want more of you. It's the same of your spirit, but we just want more of your Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Father, we don't want to go home without having received from you. We want more of that. And we, we realize that we're in charge of that volume button. And we want to crank up that volume of the Holy Spirit inside of us. We're tired of trying to live on our own. We cannot do it to live on our own. We are not capable of doing it. It is your spirit. It is your life that you have given us. And it is your spirit, and we just want more of you. We commit ourselves into your hands, and we ask, fill us, Lord. And if we're missing it, make us hungry, God. Help us to cancel out the noise that's all around us and to seek you more. This week, we just want to pay attention to you. We want to examine ourselves of where we're at. And we want to allow your spirit to convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Convict us and lead us to more of you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. You guys, have a wonderful Sunday. Stay for prayer. See you next Sunday.